it's one o'clock and time to go here. My first slide is Aristotle. No, I'm just kidding. I thought it would be kind of uh, humorous to show a busy slide and say one word and go on. Uh, kind of a Monty Python moment. At any rate, I wanted to make a couple points uh, about my viewpoint of uh, science and human knowledge. It's experiential. Uh, experiential knowledge has become more uh, uh, in the forefront, I think, since around 1975 and the 1980s. My son went to um, a very nice college in North Carolina called Elon, which uh, uh, experience, experiential knowledge or experiential learning is, is tops with them. And hands-on involvement, engagement, not just passive lecturing and that sort of thing. But uh, a couple points I'd make about Aristotle. Aristotle is, um, uh, he encouraged observation. Uh, he noted that the mast, the top of the mast was the last thing seen on ships and used that to argue that the world is round. And which I don't think he was the originator of that idea, but uh, he was using observation for his rule, his um, arguments. Uh, in contrast to Socrates, Socrates was more of a uh, in the gut, feel it in your gut type guy who would make uh, arguments based on pure philosophy and uh, devoid of experience. And um, uh, another uh, experiment that uh, Aristotle encouraged was, uh, or, or did, I guess, was uh, hens laying eggs, and he actually took the eggs on different days out from under the hens and opened them up and saw how the chick developed in the uh, egg white feeding off the yolk. And it was, um, imagine trying to uh, explain how chicks develop in an egg by pure philosophy without observation or experience. So. One last point I'll make about Aristotle before we go on is that uh, he died one year before his most famous student, who was um, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great uh, died in 321 before the Common Era. Uh, so I thought this was an interesting idea I wanted to emphasize it. It's in human nature to explore and be curious. Uh, not just humans, I mean most any animals. You know, look at cats or primates, um, um, bears, uh, uh, any, any creature that moves about, uh, they'll want to explore their environment and try to figure out what they're seeing. Um, it needs to be kind of controlled. You can see in this uh, 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 um, uh, collage uh, uh, um, uh, that um, uh, there's guidance indicated in this lower center uh, where uh, an adult is explaining uh, a story with a book and with um, pictures and the children are just fascinated by it and um, uh, just above uh, you see some of the dangers of um, curiosity and hazardous environments. Now I grew up uh, somewhat feral and wandered about um, from age four on on the 220 acre uh, primitive farm and without supervision, basically. If I wanted supervision, I would go find someone, but I wasn't really watched over much, but I did a lot of exploration. 
which I think benefited me, but now I look back on it, I'm lucky I didn't get killed in a lot of ways. It's also one's exploration and curiosity about their own physical makeup, as if the, with the little boy on the right looking down, what's that down in my pants? Is it still there? And the second question is, does it still feel good? As I've heard people say before. Okay, I wanted to make a point that I think art is an incredibly important aspect of human talent and of the ability to uh, document. Um, and the most striking and useful documentation of uh, observations began with art. It requires knowledge of materials and um, because you have to have a medium to represent like your stone wall and your pigments and a way of applying them whether you use your fingers or a stick or whatever and uh, it requires perception and internal validation of memory and dexterity in order to carry carry out the depiction and convergent stereoscopic vision and being able to put that out through your thumb and fingers. It's really quite a remarkable thing that humans are able to do. Now, birds will gather up colorful things and decorate an area trying to attract a mate, so I don't think that uh, humans are sole uh, uh, providers of art in the world, but uh, at any rate, I wanted to emphasize that I think it's really important to science. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to talk about how science even happened, uh, I think it depended on population growth. With population growth, you get growth of language. And uh, first verbal and uh, language was gestures that mean something. Uh, as, as you may or may not know, you can point to a certain area or with various animals and some will know what you're point, that you're pointing at something to look for and most of them will just say, what's in your hand? Um, but the ability to share ideas depends on as a social interaction and that involves language and uh, the uh, you have to admit that uh, being able to write uh, required art. The character is a drawing, the character for letters. And I thought this was a brilliant uh, cartoon to illustrate that. Um, uh, this is from um, uh, Wiley Miller, uh, non sequitur. Uh, it's a wonderful imaginative cartoon and uh, so, uh, further, how did it take, uh, what did it take for science to happen? Written language had to develop progressively. I think it developed uh, as a spin-off of art and manual dexterity. And so much of the um, uh, motor cortex of the brain is uh, uh, involved with control of the hands and uh, if you look at a homunculus which is a picture that's that's uh, projected on the cortex um, the amount of cortex for control of the hands is pretty remarkable the amount for control of the tongue and uh, uh, vocal tract is also pretty remarkable um, so we need critical thinkers. Um, I have some side notes here. I'm looking here to see. Okay. Uh, you know, science uh, began uh, there. I don't want to go into great um, uh, detail about ancient history. There, it's, there are biblical descriptions in the uh, Old Testament of experiments that were conducted and descriptions of experiments conducted by Nebuchadnezzar of ba Babylon. And uh, uh, 
it, it basically happened all over the world, I think, in large part. But then you had with um, higher population and subspecialization in uh, um, uh, population centers, um, you had um, uh, <laughs> uh, the emergence of situations in which people that were very gifted could uh, contribute more. And um, I, Avicenna was a Persian polymath that uh, was a good example of this, uh, who was um, uh, in the golden age of uh, Persia. And uh, uh, this is an example of uh, some of uh, his uh, output uh, from what was called the canon of medicine. It was a drawing of viscera. And it's uh, sort of a primitive drawing, but the uh, things I'd ask you to look at is, well, you can see it's, it's like a drawing of a homunculus, like I was mentioning, that's used in medicine to describe neurological pro projections. But um, this shows mostly vascularity and uh, probably heart and lungs and um, the um, digestive tract is shown in kind of a simple form right from the um, um, uh, tongue to bung, as they say in medicine. And uh, one of the points I would make about this is imagine to reproduce this. Uh, science to develop required communication between people and to have books they had to be hand copied, and the pictures had to be hand copied. Um, yes, I I, I um, was trying to indicate that I think India and China, and I mean China, uh, scientific act activities were being conducted by modern man all around the world, and it's not just uh, Eurocentric. My knowledge of it is mostly from the culture in which I grew and grew up. And um, so um, uh, one of the points I want to make is if you had to just uh, copy, if you were trying to make copied manuscripts to share with other scholars or individuals to share your information, you could make a few drawings a day and maybe a few pages of hand copied uh, manuscripts. but. Um, it would be very limiting. Well, things uh, things sped up around 1440 with the production of Gutenberg's screw press. It was uh, derived, they think, from the wine press, and he he advanced um, the ideas and figured out a way to put movable type on. And in the uh, height of the um, uh, Renaissance, the um, a single printing press could produce 3,600 pages, 3,600 pages or so a day of of uh, printed material, and um, if they did hand printing, like with a, uh, a plate or uh, wood blocks or anything like that, it would maybe 40 pages a day would be the most they could do. So this increased the availability of information and uh, dissemination of uh, information when it is uh, brought about is really important. And I think science was really um, limited to verbal and visual learning in direct contact with a source until this came along. Um, of course, you had the development of uh, communications by letters. Um, I'll just tell a quick story. The, uh, uh, the main markets, or the, you had, if, if you had some, um, something that looked promising, then you might get um, the patronage of a nobleman with uh, great wealth because of land or uh, of the church. The Catholic Church was interested in the printing press uh, because of uh, indulgences. They could uh, 
sell indulgences, which um, they can be bought in the Roman Catholic Church to forgive uh, a person for their sins on earth or to forgive someone that's already died to help uh, help a, a friend who's passed away, who's to get out of purgatory and all that sort of thing. So there was a market there for that, but mostly uh, Gutenberg printed Bibles. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay, I'm in the room. Okay, well, who invented data? <laughs> data, that's kind of an interesting point. Oh, I wanted to say one last thing about Gutenberg. Uh, he got sued. He, he ran out of money. He couldn't, he couldn't make money fast enough to pay for his needs. And one of the creditors uh, named Fust uh, forced him to give up his printing press, his type, and his ink. So he gave him up to Fuß to get out of his debt. So like Prometheus, in my vision, he found himself chained to the rocks by debt, his liver ripped out by creditors. Ain't it a nice world? I did restore his uh, position and uh, made another press and did go on to print more Bibles in his life and that sort of thing. But uh, data comes from uh, uh, a Latin word meaning fact, given or granted. Um, from 1897 on, uh, it's basically been seen as numerical facts collected for future re reference. The origins of data really relate to uh, human society and population densities where there was wealth and uh, 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 concentrations of wealth and people wanted to know how many people they controlled and uh, how much they were worth and what they could get out of them. And so census data was taken in back China uh, 2300 BCE and uh, 3050 BCE, ancient Egyptians did it, the Greeks and the Romans. Um, and um, a lot of the beginnings of, uh, well, day, boy, that's brilliant. Gutenberg, he just he, he, he should have invented counterfeiting. Uh, the only trouble, I think, back in those days, all the money was metal, and it was uh, essentially worth the metal that it contained, metal coinage, uh, if if they had coins. Um, at any rate, um, statistics was born of actuarial information and census data actuarial meaning by insurance companies and in the 16th century probability theory was first investigated by an Italian um, looking at uh, games of chance and uh, then 100 years later Fermat and Pascal corresponded and uh, started to work on uh, how to how to regard problems with uh, figuring your odds of getting uh, certain outcome with dice. One thing I'd like to say is Galileo is considered the father of experimental science, but Francis Bacon is usually granted the, uh, in most of the things you read, the um, position of having prescribed um, the um, structural approach to modern um, uh, scientific method. Now, Bacon is an interesting uh, guy in that he was not a maths guy. He was more of a lawyer. He was uh, a words guy, and he had um, administrative responsibilities in England, and um, uh, he was a procedural sort of person, and he had curiosity, and um, so he um, figured out a way to explore curiosity in uh, kind of a formalistic way, and uh, um, that's what was the beginning of the scientific method. So I, uh, my point here is that I think it's kind of interesting that a guy that uh, was not mathematical 
as Galileo was, was uh, uh, seen to be the um, founder of uh, the uh, scientific method. But, uh, although experimental science was first done in a really sophisticated way by uh, Galileo, uh, Once you had uh, printing and communications and you had uh, better communication between groups that could form, like societies uh, that um, would be interested, and we're talking about Iram uh, Literas, or Men of Letters, which is paternalistic, but is from the Latin Men of Letters. Uh, which is uh, a major way that uh, uh, scientific communications were carried out up into the Renaissance, uh, really up to the 17th century in large extent. And uh, you had the emergence of journals. And the first academic journal was in uh, this mid 17th century. Um, and uh, out of this uh, little country in Europe, is, uh, I think it's called France, and uh, uh, you've probably heard of it, and uh, uh, then you had others follow, and um, the, um, let's see, I guess it's on the next slide, yes, first peer-reviewed journal was uh, out of Scotland, um, Edinburgh, uh, Medical Essays and Observations, 1733. And I couldn't help but throw in that the Lancet, which is a, an important his, historic and still existing medical journal, was founded in 1823. It's, it's getting to where it's not so long ago. So uh, uh, at any rate, um, uh, standards emerged and um, peer review is an important um, um, the definition of it back then uh, would be different from it, what it is today, I'm sure. And uh, they very well might have known who was sending in the ideas. Uh, the modern peer review is blind, where the reviewers don't know the individuals that are sending in the article or what institution they are uh, affiliated with. Uh, or often don't. Now, I used to do peer review for um, uh, the Laryngoscope, which is the uh, journal of the uh, Triologic Society, which I joined in 1995 after I did a thesis that took me three years to write. Um, but um, uh, most most of my real understanding of uh, scientific method in pragmatic terms is based on medical background. Um, so this is a um, uh, an image I got from uh, Chantal, I guess, or, or uh, Jess that uh, was put on my abstract in the website. So I used it in the talk. It's quite nice. The, um, the scientific method as I learned about it when I was young was really rigid and very linear. And um, if you become an elite scientist or a professional science uh, person where you're publishing, you have to really look at uh, the format by which things are published, uh, by which things are done. And um, there is a parallel usually in the format of um, the uh, structure of, or layout of your ideas starting with abstract and then uh, a, a, an introduction as to what you're studying and why, and um, then methods and materials and uh, uh, findings and then conclusions, and there are often other aspects of it. But uh, that would be sort of typical for medical journals in any case, um, what I just described there. Uh, for a second, I was looking here, since I've got both slides 
uh, the, the board to the right looks the same as the slide. I thought I had double vision for a second. Um, this uh, has progressed to a more or organic uh, concept of science where you're making observations and really should be making observations all the time. Um, you develop questions when you wonder about why did that happen or what would happen if you did something different or uh, that sort of thing and you can figure out maybe a proposed answer based on what you think you know about it and then figure a way to test it. Um, science that can't be tested is, is uh, pretty close to science fiction. Uh, that's debatable. And uh, when you get into uh, um, theoretical physics and modern physics, um, uh, you can't experiment and study things without changing what you're studying, and uh, as in quantum theory, and um, you end up talking about things you can't get a handle on, like string theory or whatever. It, it uh, really gets uh, extraordinarily abstract and mathematical. Medical research tends to not be so mathematical. At any rate, you look at all your data, the, the information you've gathered, uh, and try to make assessments of it. I meant to say something about statistics. Um, the original term statistics was first used by a German scholar, Gottfried Achenwald, um, in the middle of the 18th century, and it was inten it was entirely focused on statecraft and collection of, and management of data for use by the state. Now, in English, it was first used by Sir John Sinclair, who was a Highlander, Scotland, uh, a man of Scotland, uh, and uh, wrote a 21 volume statistical account of Scotland, which was largely agriculturally, uh, agriculture uh, was considered the basis of wealth of a nation. That was a big part of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations in 1776. He saw agriculture as the primary um, determinant of wealth. And so, um, that was the focus of um, uh, 18th century um, uh, economics in particular. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I like uh, Sir John Sinclair and reading about him, he's a very interesting guy and he was uh, wealthy and didn't need to work. He had a legal background and uh, was really not a mathematics kind of guy either, but uh, he was, um, uh, using his abilities for something useful and Im impactful rather than just acquiescing to the life of the useless rich or the idle rich. At any rate, I thought the beginning of the, st the very word statistics, um, that dates to the end of the 1700s. Um, 1797, it was um, used in Encyclope Encyclopedia Britannica and um, in, um, oh, let's see, oh, uh, the, uh, Sinclair traveled in Northern Europe and that's where he picked up on it, um, uh, the idea of uh, uh, the word statistics instead of using an English word um, in his writings. Now, once you get into, uh, into um, statistics, you got a lot of data that you can accumulate easily. You start off with qualitative measurement in the, um, human history where, based on the census and eventually you start measuring off your thumb or uh, your foot or a measuring rod or you develop instruments for measurement. And then you start gathering up numbers or some representation of numbers and then you got to figure out what do you do with this. One of the major things is to look for central tendencies. So, I wanted to just impart one idea. I've talked to a number of people that were educated 
and they did not have a clear idea of the difference between precision and accuracy. And I want audience participation in this. Um, reading the definition there, if you have, um, say, a marksman, and he's got his sights off, uh, his telescope on his um, rifles off, and he shoots, and he gets a good clustering of, uh, of his um, um, holes in the target, now he's pretty precise, but if they're off skewed, then that's not accurate. Accuracy implies that there is a, like the X-Files, the truth is out there. And so you look for something representative of a valid number that represents reality. So I've got a couple of questions. This image right here, would you say it's accurate? Precise, both or neither? Answers? Okay, one says both, two say both, one says bot. <laughs> I am not a bot. <laughs> and one says precise, definitely is precise, because you have uh, every shot is right on top of the other. Think of uh, Robin Hood. He was precise and accurate. He hit the bullseye and then he split his arrow. Okay. It's both accurate and precise. So now if Robin Hood had his arrows off to the upper right and then he split his arrow that he'd already shot, he's got maybe something about his vision or his technique or the wind or something that's making um, a, an error. Maybe it's a systematic error or whatever. And uh, the more samples you get, the more you could be sure. But um, uh, he would be precise, but not accurate. So let's look at another sample. Is this accurate, precise, both or neither? Precise, precise, but not accurate. That's right. And I note I left the uh, definition above so that people could refer to it. Because I'd really like for everyone here to hold on to this and carry it away with them today, if they don't already know it. So it's precise, but inaccurate, because they're, they, missed the, they missed the bullseye can't say that's accurate. The bullseye exists. They missed it. But their data, which is where they hit, looks like, well, those are, those are my numbers. That looks like that's pretty good uh, tight measuring. So, well, it just shows you. <laughs> you never know. How here we are. This, uh, this is the same one. I made it a little larger. It's neither accurate I, I'm sorry, it's not accurate, but it is precise. So, does that make sense? But data can, uh, data by itself cannot tell you for sure if you're accurate. Uh, you got to be careful about that. How about this one? Is it accurate, precise, both or neither? Well, it certainly isn't precise because the, the hits are pretty spread out. But you, you know, you don't have to do um, um, uh, st statistics. A statistic is a piece of data, a factoid, and you take them together and you look for some parameter that represents all that data. And measurements of central tendency, like average, is um, and that's statistics. And you can look at this and see statistic, the st statistics of these hits would be average out about in the center. So this one is accurate, but not precise. 
Does that make sense? I think that's maybe the trickiest too. Finally, how about this one? Is this accurate, precise, both or neither? Yes, you can you can eyeball the distribution of the data and see where the center is. And you can also get that arithmetically. So, and part of having good number sense, which is what developed in science, is being able to look at um, things and uh, look at the data and look at the uh, graphs and uh, the pictorial representations, the art that is created from the data, and see if your mathematics fits. Well, this one is neither precise nor accurate. It's certainly off center and it's pretty widespread. They're just kind of sprayed bullets. They happen to be up there in the right hand. If they were, uh, it'd be easier, I think, if a bullet hole was off on the other side somewhere, but you know, a few more shots and you probably would have one. So to summarize, those are the uh, ways you look at it. The accurate and precise, precise but not accurate in the second from the left and uh, centering uh, geometric center is uh, on the bullseye so that's accurate but it's kind of spread out a wide distribution a wide standard deviation uh, so it's not so precise and uh, the final uh, diagram is intended to show neither situation well that's the trouble in this, you can see where the bullseye is. In science, much of the time, the bullseye is not seen. Now, I want to tell you one quick uh, vision I have. Uh, I want to move toward wrapping this up uh, and going to our experiment. Um, I kind of see science having developed. Um, imagine someone sitting a long time and their legs go to sleep. And your right foot is your qualitative foot and your left foot's your quantitative foot, and your shoelaces are tied together. When you first get up, you can't feel your legs. Your right foot doesn't know what your left foot is doing, so you can make your steps, little steps. You can't make big steps with, without being able to manage the data well. And you can't tell us where well where you're going. And your legs wake up. And uh, every time uh, a new mathematical technique is arrived at, you are able to spread your feet, stretch the strings that are tying your your shoes together um, better and you're able to take longer and longer steps. So you're taking qualitative steps and mathematical steps that are quantitative and pull quantitative science out of your uh, observations. And I think that my point is that I think that science grew with the aid of and limited by m mathematical development. Mathematics has its own history, and um, uh, much of its uh, the discoveries have been spurned on by uh, uh, scientific need, but not all of them. And often, a, mathematics has led the way, especially in the recent centuries, um, like Riemann's geometry becoming useful to Einstein. So. Okay, I wanted to mention um, medical research. We talk about clinical trials of like taking um, a drug and trying to fig figure out if it's useful for human disease. And we have phase one, phase two, and phase three. And there is a f concept of a phase four trial. Uh, that's a better scientific study than an observational trial. But uh, medicine has been really hampered by if you you can't treat 
uh, human beings like um, experimental subjects without regard for their their rights and uh, uh, not letting them know what was going on as was not so um, unusual traditionally but um, the physicians who were doing research or observations they knew what they were looking for and they believed that they the observations had to be made and sorted by someone who understood the field but that of course would introduce observational bias you have bias that you have to deal with in finding your way in all of this one way you can have single blind studies where you have the patients not knowing if they're getting a placebo or getting the real deal and that tends to remove uh, things that would uh, they do that would uh, or their reports that would bias the study this especially is important in psychology or uh, you know studies of human behavior if people know their behavior is being observed then you uh, get a lot of difference double blind studies the researcher doesn't know which group they're observing at any one time or which uh, if, if any participant of either group or um, measurement of either group uh, uh, is uh, they so you don't get uh, observational bias and um, the person that analyzes this uh, the which can be a statistician often science has grown to the point that it requires a lot of self uh, su uh, subspecialization and support uh, from multidisciplinary uh, approaches and if statistics blows you away then don't sweat it get a statistician it's a huge huge field but um, uh, the statistician uh, is more easily trusted if they don't know the um, uh, uh, differences or what's being looked at in if they get raw data without knowing what it's representing then they won't s try to spin it one of the problems is that um, using normative type uh, distributions, for instance, you throw at you you have justification to throw out outliers, but you can have rare events that are seem statistically insignificant, but are are significant. As with uh, medicine, if somebody gets um, transverse myelitis of the spine from a vaccine it's a rare event but if you say well it's an outlier and you just ignore it you may end up uh, exposing uh, a lot of people to problems when the vaccine becomes generally available so um, uh, open trials on the bottom there that's uh, uh, where everybody knows what's going on and it really is um, laden with bias and uh, people avoid those as much as they can wanted to say just generally science is a culture if, if you think of medicine uh, think of music and how big it is you maybe just appreciate music you want to ask where, where do I fit in with science what can I do with science well like you enjoy music you can be a science enthusiast or appreciate it if you have enough drive and curiosity and um, you can do some exploration start playing guitar play violin if you're um, uh, naturally driven uh, and creative and, uh, and maybe like um, uh, Faraday uh, there's been lots of important amateur scientists and uh, mathematicians too you can be like these guys, these two lads in the upper right hand corner there, uh, John Lennon, and Paul McCartney, uh, who just saw it, just write some songs, change the world. Uh, if you're more trained, uh, you can be an, an elite musician like um, Philip Glass or Leonard Bernstein at the top, or uh, even here's another Robert Johnson there and came out of the uh, Delta 
uh, untrained. Uh, some said he was trained by the devil. He went down to the crossroads. Anyway, there's all kinds of ways to fit in. And think of it like music. You can appreciate and love music and get a lot out of it uh, and contribute to it by supporting it or by producing it. So I thought it was a nice metaphor. I wanted to share it with you. And one of my favorites up in the left, left hand corner, Marian Anderson. That's Marian Anderson singing uh, at the um, uh, Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. to an open, open air audience um, after the um, uh, Daughters of the American Revolution uh, refused to let her sing for them. And uh, Eleanor Roosevelt arranged for her to perform and she had a marvelous voice. And that down in the lower, right below a picture of me playing violin and my son playing guitar, myself playing guitar on the left, that's uh, Camille Chasson, Camille Chasson, uh, like Carnival of the Animals and Danse Macabre and such. Anyway, just for your information, data science, huge, cool field that uh, deals with big data. It pays great. What is it? It's a buzzword. It deals with all kinds of stuff. Um, domain experience is a word that comes up and that's knowledge and understanding of a specific field of inquiry in great depth. Programming skills are good and knowledge of mathematics and statistics. If want to get involved in science or you have a, a, a family or a member or a friend or a, someone you're mentoring, get them to go volunteer in the laboratory and to work with someone who's doing research and to try to keep their eyes open and learn everything they can in a vertical sense about um, what's being done in the lab and what it takes to be able to set up a lab. Um, Trying to go it alone and doing serious science is almost impossible. And just again, just for per, uh, your information, uh, if you want to know what to look at uh, and try to learn about or at least be aware of uh, for background in data science, uh, operations research, which deals with optimization problems, linear algebra, um, multivariate calculus, function theory, statistics and probabilities, the top thing, and discrete mathematics has a role in this too. That's all I'm going to say about that. There's also this, uh, you should know, in 1935 this book was published by um, the design of experiments that changed all uh, of experimental science by Ronald Fisher, he's Brit, um, an Englishman, um, and you can have that as a free download. Um, 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 off of Google Books, and he had a famous uh, experiment about a lady tasting tea. So, I want to encourage you maybe to explore that book. At least know about uh, Ronald A. Fisher. Um, and um, he was no, so nearsighted he was nearly blind, but uh, he was an absolute genius, fascinating individual. And invented the idea of the null hypothesis where you think, oh, I think something works this way. Well, you say, let's say it doesn't work this way and you do an experiment uh, with two groups and you have ways of testing to see if those two groups come from different populations. And when he joined, it was his contribution to um, England really arose from working in agriculture and trying to figure out how to produce food the best for um, Great Britain. And um, he had all kinds of data that went back to 1840. And so he developed a N O V A or analysis of variations to be able to look at 
three or more populations and see if they were from the same uh, population or not. And by saying that they were, to see what the probability of them being from the same population would be. Okay, failings in science. Well, there's fallacies of logic. We've all seen these. And I just found this was a kind of an interesting one. There's failure to plan ahead. One way I would emphasize, one thing, it's not uncommon that people that come into a field and then they start doing research in something, but they really don't master all the past literature and they end up reinventing the wheel and reinventing terms. And uh, I saw this some when I was doing reviews of literature and I had a chairman at the University of Pennsylvania and he was just brutal to people who would get up at a conference and they'd gotten in and, um, you know, have to go through a little bit of a gauntlet to get to present and they would present this stuff and he would get up and point out to them how this had been done and how the terms were just a little different and they hadn't done their homework. So planning ahead and having a good basis for what you're doing is really important. There are conflicts and uh, from the beginning, uh, like Galileo being taken over to look at the uh, uh, machines of torture to see if he wanted to re, uh, recant his uh, uh, scientific theories uh, because it was embarrassing to uh, theologists who wanted to extend their religious authority to physical universe um, or overextend. So, um, I thought this was a brilliant uh, Wiley Miller uh, caricature about uh, an inherent uh, difficulty. It depends on what culture you're in, and it's not just the theologians, but also just the public with their uh, dog dogmatic point of view at times can be disruptive. And Who is paying for the research is important, of being transparent about it. And, you know, and um, um, I, I can't think of the guy's name right now, but uh, he determined the age of the earth, but he also uh, determined that uh, lead from leaded gasoline was poisoning the world, and the industry took him on and, and they cut off his research funds and he went on to uh, keep studying but they he did a um, yeah Claire Patterson um, from Iowa I think um, and uh, the first person he let know who how old the world was uh, 4.5 billion years or 4.3 billion years he went and told his mother so she was the first other person in the world to get to know that um, 4.55 I thank you <laughs> I stand corrected but yeah, you you need to be objective, and you shouldn't uh, uh, contrive your research to uh, fit a conclusion. One of the problems with proprietary research is um, they will hold back information if it um, hurts them, uh, hurts their bottom line. So. Um, One thing about science, we got to be careful we don't lose our audience. Somehow we got to make it uh, accessible and uh, a fun part of the culture. And uh, people get discouraged, just like people can get discouraged about uh, voting and um, by a disruptive society uh, or a disruptive uh, uh, situation in government and people think, well, my vote's not going to matter or they, they're just making it too hard. Uh, people looking at the uh, uh, newscasts or the uh, popular literature, they will usurp and take some spectacular sounding article and make a big deal out of it. And it hasn't even really been uh, 
um, made the rounds with other scientists to see if it's uh, 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 reproducible. And uh, also you gotta realize that uh, research can seem pretty primitive at first. And uh, uh, the techniques and such can be pretty, pretty um, unimpressive. But if you keep working at it, you can uh, find uh, reindeer that fly, I suppose, according to this picture. Okay, one last one is, uh, I used, it was a, I met this man once as a Proxmire, Senator Proxmire of, uh, of uh, Wisconsin, and he would give the Golden Fleece Award for, uh, it was, it was kind of a uh, political spectacular uh, thing that would make it in the news about some useless research. And I thought it was often unfair. Uh, this is, a, this cartoon seems a little bit hostile towards science, but, uh, some of it is going to be useless, but so are kids. You know, Faraday had this generator. He would do his demonstration, at, or I guess an electric motor, I believe, uh, at uh, a Christmas demonstration. And some lady said, sir, what earthly use is that? And he said, madam, of what earthly use is a newborn baby? So you got to, you know, just doing something, you'll develop things to observe and new directions. Okay, let's see, I think I'm ready for my, this is gonna be quick. It's almost Miller time, except we're gonna do Polly Girl. I had a couple of uh, potential um, experiments. Like I noticed spinners, I had a little cup of water and a cutting of a plant and I was trying to get it to root and I had spinners. We got mosquitoes in the house from opening the door, and they laid eggs uh, in the water. And then we had mosquitoes developing in a cup of water. And there's really, that's the sort of situation where you make the observation, you see these little spinners. You could do a lot of uh, studies of that. But the study I thought I would do is this. Some years ago, I, I had a warm beer. I, I can't drink beer now because I can't tolerate wheat, uh, uh, I've discovered, but uh, explained a lot of things. But uh, at any rate, I took it and put it in the freezer because I like it cold. I don't actually like warm beer. And when I took it out, uh, it had uh, about frozen, but uh, uh, I let it thaw a little bit and it was slushy. and. Uh, I enjoyed it, although it had a kind of a chunk of ice in the center, it had to thaw, and it, it wasn't quite right. So I did it again and uh, did it for a shorter time, and uh, I ended up getting a beer one time, and I was kind of casually looking at the clock, and I popped the, um, the lid off the, um, or the cap off the bottle, and it was liquid at first, and fresh out of the freezer, and it suddenly turned to slush. It just had crystallization take place in, in a large part of it. And I drank it, and it was absolutely wonderful. And uh, just between you and me, if you want to try this, uh, I do it, I did it, I, I preferred dark German beer. Um, the uh, I found in my particular freezer, just open it, put one bottle in and close. Um, because if you open the freezer a lot, you'll have the temperature change. And if you put more in one bottle in, you'll have two warm things to cool. So you, uh, just one bottle, 13 minutes, and it would turn to this wonderful slushy beer. It was really a treat. What kind of experiments? That's, a, and that's an observation. This beer turned to slush from a liquid in an instant. So, yeah, there's theories one uh, can draw on. What sort of um, uh, uh, hypothesis can you make about uh, what happened there? That's what I thought too, Vic. I thought that uh, the carbon dioxide in the beer, uh, some of it was released 
it, it depresses the freezing point and, and when you pop the, uh, the cap off um, it uh, um, would uh, lose some of the carbon dioxide and the freezing point would go up above um, I, I'm, I'm sorry the, the yeah the freezing point would go up uh, um, um, above the temperature at which it was and so it, it would suddenly have precipitous formation of these crystals um, and uh, I think the bottle was strong enough that it could tolerate uh, the freezing and a little bit of expansion. One, it's a good question why it didn't explode. But uh, how could you test that? Let's take that as your, you know, thing you want to test. That uh, say you think it's the carbon dioxide that uh, made the difference. Any ideas how one would test that? Simple experiment. You could freeze flat beer. You could freeze a water bottle. Yeah. This wine has a lot of salute too. But it wouldn't be, uh, and that would, wine would uh, help separate the idea of it being uh, the carbon dioxide versus uh, salute. And you could use a sparkling wine versus, uh, yes, a regular wine. And each, as you go along, you can make observations. You could also do experiments to see how long the uh, uh, beer was left in the freezer and what the changes were. That's interesting. Jamming a cork into a champagne bottle. I have always had to trim uh, the cork with a sharp knife if I wanted to recork a champagne or um, you're supposed to just drink it and let it, what happens happens. <laughs> so any other ideas about that? Leftover champagne. <laughs> there you go. Not a concept. That's not going to happen, right? So my point in this slide is that I, I thought back on my own experience in day-to-day -day life, and I thought that was kind of one, of one that was neat and reproducible. I could re reproduce those conditions. And I had something that was sort of standard, these kinds of bottles of beer that one could get and um, experiment with it. And I did that, and I, I drank slushy beer. I developed a procedure for producing it based on you know, kind of trial and error and experimentation that was sort of organic following this um, uh, cycle on the scientific method that you see to the right. So um, uh, I hope that... Um, You'll keep your eyes open for unusual things that may come up and uh, in your own day-to-day -day life and explore them. And for many things, you don't have to have a mass spectrometer or, uh, you know, uh, uh, chemistry lab to uh, do a lot of basic qualitative experiments, particularly, or simple experiments for, uh, where you can things like weights and uh, or sampling, how you would sample, giving it to different people to see if they like it. There's a lot of ways you could create experiments and results that you could describe to somebody and then they'd probably get their attention if you showed them a bottle of Poly Girl because I bet everybody woke up when I showed this. Okay, one last look. I want you to remember accurate, precise versus not accurate, not precise, um, and accurate, not precise, and not accurate, precise, not in that order. I went out of order there, but uh, I want you to remember that concept. I think it would be a good fundamental concept for everybody interested in science to know. Citizen science, I think it's great. It needs to, that one, one concern 
in citizen science, you can end up with pseudoscience and um, uh, it, uh, it can go astray more readily. I think in professional science with it, it you have this organic scientific method often going on, but in the presentation of it in journals, it's presented as though it were a, a more rigid uh, uh, exploration and uh, handling of the data and such as though you had a perfect uh, uh, hypothesis at first. And But often that's taken from a larger body of experience. That's one reason why some of the most productive labs are exploring a topic and they'll come up with lots of projects in that topic. Just like industry with a product will come up with a lot of discoveries and exploration related to that. So any other comments, questions? You know, I would be interesting to know what the structure of the, or the orientation of the molecules in beer are. Because I don't know that they would be like water. You can't assume it, I don't think. At any rate, that concludes my talk. I left out a lot of things, but it's a huge subject. And I'm only six minutes past. That's the best I've done. <laughs> Thank you. Right, there's so much ground to cover. I thought that if I could in, in, stimulate uh, thought about it, uh, that would be that would be cool. Yeah, well, thank uh, Synergy uh, wants me to uh, analyze my talks. Well, I did practice at Synergy, and you had suggested I do that earlier on. Oh, I just got a message that someone has experimented on beer and cocktail crystallinization. Interesting. I'll have to look at that. Vic sent me a message about that. <laughs> well, this was a talk for all ages. So, It's a good point, CB. I think it's not just understanding the scientific method, but I wish that they were receptive to it. But you have so many gestalts and belief systems where people think that their preconceived notions or their dogma that, to which they intend to adhere are going to be challenged. And so they start out a, a priori rejecting science. I think science is going to have to do a better job of selling itself and reaching people. It's become, it's extraordinary what it can achieve, but it's even for people that are in science, I, I, I have a pretty good understanding of uh, uh, mathematics, I feel like in uh, like from the data science list, and there's a lot of things I can read where I wonder really what in the hell are they talking about? The science, uh, the uh, mathematics they're using, uh, it can be so arcane. Um, but um, I don't know how we can compete with people that are telling people uh, simple stories that they want to believe. But we're going to have to figure out a way. Yes, Ciencia. 
Scientia means knowing from Latin. Well, I don't know. Uh, peerless is sort of like the number one. It's the loneliest number, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Day. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Nikki. Appreciate it, Vic. And thank you, Shiloh. I guess I'll turn my microphone off. I really appreciate everyone's attendance and um, uh, interest, and um, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks, Sanergy. <laughs> Thank you.